Welcome back. This is the baffling story of the cold case death of 17-year-old Mark Haynes. The teenager's body was found on rail tracks just south of the city of Tamworth in New South Wales. Despite a police investigation and a coronial inquest which followed, the cause of his death remains unknown as do the circumstances which led him to be on the tracks that night. But 33 years on, Mark's family still maintain he was murdered, calling the police investigation a sham and continuing their fight for justice. Alan Clark, a Murawari man and an award-winning investigative journalist, producer and presenter, spent five years investigating the case and his reporting has sparked a resurgence of interest that has seen the file reopened and a police review of the initial investigation. The following is his presentation, Cold Justice, Blood on the Tracks, which I have uploaded in two parts. You can find the link to part two below. NITV wishes to advise that this program may contain images of people who have passed. Welcome to this special 90 minute investigation into the death of Mark Haynes. In 2013, I met Mark's family and they have always maintained that he was murdered. The 17 year old was found dead on railway tracks outside of Tamworth in 1988 their dogged determination to get justice in the face of an apathetic police force was moving. I promised I would help them with their cause. Four years later and my investigation into Mark's death culminated in cold justice. The series was instrumental in finding several police flaws in the initial investigation and led to a review into the handling of the case. Tissues taken from Mark's organs were also handed back to the family They'd been taken in 1988 without their knowledge or permission. Cold Justice also helped the family lobby for a reward. And earlier this year, the Oxley Local Area Command announced a half a million dollar reward for any information that could solve the case. It's been 30 years since Mark was found on that lonely stretch of railway tracks and his family deserve justice. It's 6.30 a.m. on January 16, 1988, just outside the small northwestern New South Wales city of Tamworth. A night of summer rain has blanketed the area with humidity. The sun struggles to break through the heavy grey and black clouds as the morning freight train from Tamworth to Werris Creek picks up speed and breaks away from suburbia into bushland. Suddenly, the driver spots something on the train tracks. It's 17-year-old Mark Haynes. Just three hours before, Mark was happy and alive. What happened in those few hours have remained a mystery for 29 years. What happened to Mark Haynes? It's a question that his family have been asking themselves for close to three decades. 
Do what you should have done 29 years ago and investigate Aboriginal deaths as non-Aboriginal deaths and use your resources like you do now and then, but never for Aboriginals. My name is Alan Clark. I'm a Murrawari man and a journalist. In 2013, I was sent on assignment to Tamworth for the program Living Black to cover an appeal to the public for any information that could lead to Mark's killer. Mark's then girlfriend, Tanya, she said... The appeal was being made by his family on the anniversary of his death. And our family, yeah, we need closure for this. We need questions answered. Nothing's been answered. I had no idea what I was flying into or how deeply this family's unwavering quest for justice would touch me. There's no way he would have just went out there. Put it down, went out on them tracks by himself. Four years later, I believe there has been a miscarriage of justice. My reporting for BuzzFeed News last year saw the case reopened and actively investigated once again. Now in 2017, the family are closer than ever to getting answers. I've uncovered documents never before seen by the public. I've never really seen the written documents, but mm. see all those statements after probably, what, 29 years. It's good to read it, actually, and just get the factual stuff. Yeah. I've also interviewed some of Australia's most respected forensic and legal experts. No, that wouldn't happen. You know, yeah. <laughs> again, it doesn't make sense. Who offer startling revelations about the case. There's also a lot of unanswered questions yet, and I think for the sake of the family, uh, the questions need to be answered. Since then, new leads have come forward after almost three decades in silence. Screech to a stop. What came to a stop? I heard the brakes screech so loudly. They agree to speak despite fear of violent retribution from the alleged killers. And we have also uncovered a potential motive for Mark's murder. You, you do the wrong thing, you, you're going to die. It's as simple as that. You can get bashed up a couple of times, but then the end result is you haven't learnt your lesson, it's death. Mark was a handsome young man who was talented at sports and very popular. He didn't have a care in the world, according to his friends and family. Good kid and just like enjoyed his life and his mates and going out and yeah. Good person. Well, he was a good person, so he would have made a great, great man, a great father. He was loyal. He was a loyal brother, you know, big brother, typical big brother. Oh, he was just a good person. He was quiet and he just easy going, he was. But he was good looking and popular, yeah, easy going. Tragically, both of Mark's parents, Josie and Ron, died without ever knowing what happened to their son. But they, along with his family, always maintained he would never have taken his own life. They maintain he was murdered and placed on the train tracks. In the beginning, the local police, members of the Oxley Local Area Command, chose to pursue the theory that Mark had stolen a car, crashed it, and then decided to lay down on the train track seven kilometres out of town. That theory doesn't square up when you consider that several witnesses came forward at the time, saying that Mark had been killed over his knowledge of marijuana crops. Another indication that he might have been murdered is the fact that he couldn't even drive a car. So how could he actually steal one? Um, he had no clue. He just didn't know, he didn't know what the parts was, he didn't know how to change gears. He, he kangaroo hopped that car, he stalled it, he got out of it, he slammed the door. He, he had no clue how to drive a manual car. And that was, you know, a, weeks leading up to his death and, and for the police to claim that he drove, stole and drove a manual car, to me it was totally unbelievable because he just physically could not do it. 
a coronial inquest into Mark's death returned open findings. Those findings stated that Mark died from a massive head injury, but couldn't decide how he received that injury. Since 1988, the death has largely remained a cold case. We came in here approximately three months ago. I gave them... The police have not made public any new leads, and the family believes they are not making serious efforts to solve it. Mark's family are adamant if they were non-Indigenous, the case would have been solved by now. So the inference is that, well, you know, an Aboriginal boy is likely to do something like this. Well, th this is uh, um, the way any Aboriginal person um, um, is treated, whether it's within the law or outside, or outside of the law. It's, uh, you know, we, we, we feel like we, we're third, if not fourth class citizens in our own land. From the outset, uh, this is right out of character for Mark and uh, no, uh, we uh, believe he's met with foul play. We do not believe he has uh, went out there and laid down and uh, of his own volition and was, uh, was uh, hit by the train by some misadventure. Yeah, come on through here, here we go. It's impossible to talk about Mark's murder without talking about his uncle, Don Craigie. No one to everyone as duck. He was uh, killed all, uh, instantaneously. Don is an unstoppable force when it comes to the case. With my last breath, you know, I will still be looking to find out what has happened to Mark. I truly believe if it wasn't for Don, Mark's case would have faded into the past and he would have become another statistic. Was there anything, uh, any repercussions? No. As I said to my younger brothers, I said I'd take full responsibility for it. From the very beginning, he has doggedly been asking questions, lobbying politicians and demanding answers from the local police. How did the police immediately kind of treat the family in the following months afterwards? You know when you get something stuck uh, on the bottom of your shoe? Yeah, you know, and you try to scrape it off or whatever, it's just like uh, uh, they just didn't want to have a bar of us. You know, we've got uh, all we need, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, the, the case is closed. So words of that effect. And at the inquest, how did they treat you? Badly. Nothing uh, happened. I kept going back to the police station. I kept running uh, into... Uh, the superintendent, he keeps saying, well, Don, you never know what, what, what a 17-year-old boy would do. You never know what a 17-year-old Aboriginal boy would do. Uh, they, they just weren't interested in, in investigating uh, any further. Before we start exploring the flaws in the investigation, it's important to go back to that fateful summer night and retrace Mark's last movements. On Friday, January the 15th, 1988, intermittent showers sweep across the vast Gomorrah traditional lands. On an overcast day like that, the region with its undulating hills and hidden sacred sites takes on an ominous feel. We know that evening Mark decided to go out with some mates. Mark leaves his auntie Barb's house that evening with his cousin Leah Craigie and her boyfriend Raymond Irvine. They make their way across the train tracks that divide Coldale, the Aboriginal community, from the rest of town. They are the very same tracks he would later be found dead on. Sometime between 10 and 10.30 p.m., Mark meets up with his girlfriend Tanya White and a group of friends. Now called Honky Tonks, that bar just over there used to be called Domino's Nightclub. And on the night of Mark's death, he spent a few hours there with his girlfriend, Tanya White. They left the club at about 2 a.m. and then continued on their walk down Bridge Street to the center of town. At 2.30am, both couples stop here and say goodbye to each other. 
Mark and Tanya then walked across these ovals up to Gunniganoo Road, which leads to South Tamworth, where Tanya lived. Mark and Tanya then continue their journey up Bell Street and turn left here into Churchill. Now this spot is very significant because a woman that used to live in that house over there in 1988 said that she heard a very distressed young man begging to be left alone on the night of Mark's death. She said that happened between 3.20 and 3.30 a.m. Now 15 minutes after she heard that argument, she then heard a car come flying up this street and head up to Wilbertree, then turn the corner and suddenly screech to a halt. And this is where that speeding car came to a stop, according to that woman, the corner of Wilbertree and Edward Street. It's also the very same street that Tanya told the inquest that she said goodbye to Mark at around 3.30 a.m. in the morning while she continued on to Kayuma Street. It was the last time anyone would see Mark alive. the driver of a train travelling from Tamworth to Werris Creek sees what he thinks are rags on the track. As the train lurches closer, he realises it's a human and frantically pulls the emergency brake. It's too late. The train passes over the body. The driver's heart is pounding. He makes the long walk to the end of the train where he finds Mark. Part of Mark's skull had been sheared off and he had several deep cuts around his body. However, he was relatively untouched by the 200 ton train. And despite those injuries, the first people here on the scene all said there was very little blood around the area. Even stranger than the lack of blood was a towel found underneath Mark's head. Another anomaly was the lack of mud found on his shoes and clothes. That's strange because each side of the train tracks was surrounded by mud caused by heavy rains the night before. I'm around a kilometre and a half from where Mark's body was found, just up here. This is also the spot where that stolen Tirana had rolled and come to a stop on the side of the train tracks and been left. Now, the train driver coming into Tamworth even noticed that car, yet the police failed to see the importance of the vehicle. They failed to fingerprint it or take it into evidence, and the car was left there for at least another six weeks before being removed. The police failed to see the towel underneath Mark's head as important evidence, and they lost it, admitting at the inquest that they had no idea where it was. The car and the towel weren't the only things the police failed to take from the scene. A few days later, the family came out here and they found a cigarette lighter and a comb. They thought it might be important evidence and they had to take it themselves into the police station. One of the first constables on the scene would later claim to have taken the evidence himself when it was pointed out that it was actually the family that handed it in. He said it may have fallen from the evidence bag. The treatment from the police, the lack of communication, I mean, that's a bit of a shame. Like, last few years, yep, it's had yep. to be journalists or politicians yes. just to get them to talk to you. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and we're black and... Well, well, we, well that, we believe that oh, yeah. is uh, that we believe that is the case, yes, because we're Aboriginal people. If this was a white boy, do you think it would be different? Yes, we know so. We, we know so. We've seen that many uh, uh, deaths being investigated around Tamworth. They pulled up uh, for non-Aboriginal uh, people 
people, they pulled up all stops. They'd have, you know, the, the, the town would be swamped with police. You know, you, you, you couldn't even drive around unless you were getting pulled up, you know, by some strange police all the bloody time. As the number of black deaths in custody has steadily risen, this nation and its politicians have been shamed into action. When Mark was found dead, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was beginning to uncover horrific institutionalised racism within the Australian police force. This sickening VHS footage showing two New South Wales police officers at an Outback charity event mocking Aboriginal men Lloyd Boney, who died in police custody, and David Gundy, who was killed after being shot by police, gives a glimpse into this culture. Not all police officers were racist or held those views, but there was a real divide between the police and the Indigenous community. Shortly after Mark's death, Tamworth residents took to the streets to celebrate the city's country music festival. Get inside and buy yourself a scalp. While Australia was also celebrating 200 years of colonisation. <laughs> While this was happening, Mark's body was cold on a slab in the local morgue. I had to go and have a look at him for myself. I had to go, uh, when I seen him stretched out or laying out on the table there, uh, I had to look twice. I could not recognise him. Last year, I approached David Shoebridge, New South Wales Greens MP and barrister, on behalf of Mark's family, who were deeply unsatisfied with the way the local area command were handling the case. After reviewing Mark's files, he was scathing. Uh, cursory, uncaring, um, amateur. They, are, they would be the des descriptions I'd give to the investigation. You know, a young Aboriginal man found dead on railway tracks. Oh, he, he must have taken his own life or just laid down and been killed by a train. You know how it happens. That doesn't just happen. It, it seems so grossly implausible that, um, you know, I formed a very, very, very congregate view that um, we needed an investigation by somebody other than the local area command who had been dithering around with it um, for the better part of three decades. In April 2016, a woman, Jessica, whose identity we've obscured for her own safety, came forward after reading one of my articles for BuzzFeed News on Mark's death. She came forward with a startling revelation that her son Chris had driven the car that took Mark's body out to the train tracks. Mark was supposed to have been in the boot and taken to the spot um, and placed on the um, railway line. So that was very intense. Uh, Jessica told me that Chris killed himself just barely six months after Mark had died by shooting himself in the family home. It's pretty tragic. Jessica also claims her youngest son knows what happened to Mark. My other son was threatened to be quiet about whatever he knew. The information given by Jessica saw the case reopened. But any excitement about the investigation being active again was quickly extinguished when in October 2016, David travelled to Tamworth to meet Don for the first time. So this is where Mark's body was, was yeah. found? Yeah. Um, when was the first time you came here? Well, I, I wanted to arrange a meeting with the Oxley Local Area Commander. I think it's, it's good protocol as an MP. If you're coming in, you want to talk about a police investigation, it's good protocol to contact the local area command and say I'm coming in and I wanted to have a, a, a sit down chat with the super. I, not only did I not get an, an invitation to a meeting, I basically got warned off by the super, the, the head of the Oxley local area command, uh, you know, don't come knocking at, at the police station, don't talk to my officers. Um, I find that remarkable. I mean, and, and I'll say on the record, it's not all local area commands have that kind of a shutdown approach. David returned to state parliament and lobbied to have the case given to the elite state crime command's homicide squad. The unit have solved several high-profile cold cases. 
A lot has changed in policing since 1988. I recognise that. But for Mark's family, they are still living with the failures of the past. Uncle Don Craig will not rest till justice is done, and nor should any of us. Then, on the 29th anniversary of Mark's death in January 2017, the family, along with David, staged a protest outside the local police station. If he was a, wasn't an Aboriginal boy, if he was non Aboriginal, was an Anglo Saxon kid, all resources would have been made available and investigated uh, similarly to other uh, non Aboriginal deaths around him. There's movement on the cold case of Tamworth teenager Mark Haynes. The family has been calling for the case to be moved from the Oxley Local Area Command to the state's homicide squad. And today they got what they've been asking for. And I understand that the state crime command are willing to conduct a review of the investigation. The state crime command are now conducting a full review of the Tamworth police investigations into Mark's death over the past 29 years. If they find any of those investigations were inadequate in any way, they'll take on the case. It was one small victory for the family in a long and exhausting journey for justice. Later that night, at a candlelight vigil, the grief was as raw as ever. gonna go quietly in the night like Mark did but he didn't go quietly he would have put up a fight and I tell you what if you's out there if you're still out there get ready for a bigger fight cuz I ain't alone anymore Tamworth is a picturesque small city, a tight-knit community that prides itself on good old-fashioned down-to-earth country hospitality. Since time immemorial, the Gomorrah people have called this place home. That was before they were violently dispossessed during the frontier wars. Today, their spilt blood is hidden beneath sweeping Art Deco veneers. And that's the thing about regional Australia. Dig long enough and you'll uncover dirty secrets. In the case of Tamworth in 1988, I've uncovered a murky underbelly full of violence and drugs and alleged police corruption. I found someone who was part of that scene, a former drug dealer named Mr Q. Now Mr Q has agreed to sit down with me and offer me an insight into that world. A lot of drugs around and, and it was coming through people that I know and through the police. It was like an older generation that you looked up to and they were the ones that were supplying, basically. Like how rife would you say the drug trade was in Tamworth? Oh, it's like going to the green grocery and buying an apple. It, when you're in the drug trade, it, it, if you're serious in that area, there's only two ways out. The main way is death or jail. Mark had never been in trouble with the law. By all accounts, he was charming yet reticent. It's unlikely that he was part of that underbelly. However, it is likely that Mark was aware of the marijuana crops scattered throughout the dense bushland that rings around Tamworth. Some of the statements given to the police and Mark's family solicitor by his friends claim that he may have been planning to steal some of those crops, possibly with another person. Mr Q says that the penalty for knocking off crops would normally be a bashing but he tells me that Mark's death looks like a warning gone wrong. How big are these crops, would you say? Or were they talking about lots of little ones or were they just big ones or...? Lots of little ones and I heard of a few big ones as well. But you knew to stay away from them because 
that were protected. And when you say protected, what do you mean? Well, you knew that if you went near them, you either kill or be killed. Simple as that. The theory that Mark may have been bashed by thugs as a warning comes up in a document I've obtained from 1988. This document was not tendered at the inquest, but it is a revealing transcript of a meeting between Mark's family solicitor and a woman and two young men, referred to as Mr X and Mr Y. The trio offer allegations claiming that Mark was murdered by a group of men. After years of research, I found that woman and she agreed to speak with me about what she told the solicitor back in 1988. So she came in and volunteered that information to um, the solicitors that were looking after the, um, the family, Mark's family. She's a little bit scared because she doesn't want to be identified. You know, there's uh, the thing with this case is that a lot of people are still terrified to speak publicly because there's a fear that some of those people that might have been involved in Mark's death still live in Tamworth. Like so many people connected with this case, we've had to change her identity. We've given her the name Marilyn. Marilyn's son, Jackson, was a good friend of Mark. They were the same age and ran in the same circles. Tragically, Jackson died around six months after Mark was found dead. Before he died, Jackson confided in his mother, telling her that he had found out that Mark's death was no accident. When I arrive at her house, Marilyn tells me she is terrified of speaking up, but also wants Mark's family to get some closure. Do you remember your, your son ever saying anything about Mark? Yes. I can remember sitting in our lounge room one Sunday I was ironing, and he said to me, Mum, I'm going to find out what happened to Mark. And I just said to him, don't boy, stay away from it. I said, because you could end up dead like him, and it could be made to look like an accident. Your son thought highly of Mark? Yeah, he did. <laughs> and um, I can remember him saying, Mum, he doesn't deserve this. He doesn't deserve it. Marilyn had been on edge since a friend had warned her about a young girl who had come to Jackson's 18th birthday party. The girl was allegedly connected to one of the suspects in Mark's death. Then one night she heard Jackson on the phone speaking to the same girl and she told him to be careful. Yeah, he was going to meet her somewhere and I said, don't go. And yeah, you didn't want him to go because you'd heard that she was hanging around these people. Well, I was told they were bad news. Well, freaked you out enough to beg him not to go out? Yes. This used to be Tamworth Catholic High School, Rosary College, and that's where that girl Marilyn remembers actually was a student. And Marilyn remembers her because she did something odd at Jackson's funeral. She placed a note on his coffin. And the reason that's strange is because Marilyn says Jackson really didn't like her. Within a week of Jackson dying, Marilyn spoke with two of his best mates about the rumours she'd heard around Mark's death. What she heard prompted her to take them directly to Mark's solicitor. I was so scared. Every time a car went past, I ducked down because I was frightened bullets were going to come flying at me. And that's gospel truth. The boys are referred to as Mr X and Mr Y, and their statements are incredibly detailed and shocking. For legal reasons, we've had to redact most of the names in the documents. Mr X told the solicitor that he had been watching videos with a group of people, including the girl that Marilyn mentioned when Mark's death came up in conversation. She told Mr X that Mark was targeted by a group of men over his knowledge of a marijuana crop. Mr X refers to Mark by his nickname, Stoney. The week before, a heap of them got together at a house drinking. Stoney came up and one of them said, he knows too much, what are we going to do about him? She understood that it was something to do with a crop of drugs. She told me that it was all planned out and that two girls were present. A stolen Tirana was found crashed near Mark's body. 
The police didn't fingerprint it, and according to Mark's family, they left it there for at least six weeks, exposed to the elements. The detective's initial theory was that Mark had stolen it, despite him not being able to drive, crashed it, and then lay down on the tracks before being struck by a train. In the statement given by Mr X, he says the girl claimed that the car was used as a ruse. She told me the following week a car had been stolen from Wilbertree Street, the group having been all at Domino's earlier that night. She told me that they then drove out with Stoney in the stolen car to where there was another car. She said that the stolen car was to be used as a plant. She said that Mark was hurt. Two of them held him, laid into him and hurt him badly in the stomach so that he was really badly hurt and that they then put him on the railway tracks. Mr X names those two men in his statement and time and time again I also see the names pop up in other witness statements. Now in 1988 they were well known local boxers and also standover men. In the following weeks after Mark's death the family, still in shock, continually asked the detectives in charge of the case for updates. Don claims that he was told by the detectives that he would be better off making his own inquiries because people in the community weren't speaking to the police. He said, well, look, you know, people have been telling you stuff, uh, but they won't talk to us. The, the detective said, you go out, make your own inquiries, because no one, meaning the Aboriginal community, w would talk to them. Yes, yes, it was words of that effect. But telling you essentially to go out and do your own investigation. Yes, yes. Which is dangerous. Yes. In a blur of grief and anger, Don started asking questions around town. And then one night he says he was viciously attacked by the brother of the main suspect named by Mr X. He was then told the man was waiting outside with a gun. I was approached uh, in the Town Talk Hotel. I was uh, standing there having a beer, watching a game of uh, pool. And I was approached. I said, look, I've been hearing rumours that your brother and others have been involved in the death of my nephew. Before I, you know, I can turn back again, I felt a whack, whack. A left and a right. I had a beer in my hand. I went backwards. And as I stood up, I can feel my jaw starting to uh, ache and like it was separating. Broken. Broken. Mm. But then uh, s some young chap came into the hotel and said to me, Uncle Duck, I seen at the back of the pub behind the industrial bins with a rifle. How you going? Hello. Hi. Thank you. Yes, how are you? Good. I'll give you this. Jack Craigie, Mark's uncle, was on the front line with his brother Don in searching for answers. Only investigation was what's happening was me and Duck hmm. going out, going from pub to pub, club to club, f doing the back steps, asking everybody, yeah. and and the police was watching us, actually watching us come out the pubs and clubs. Glenda, Jack's wife, recalls the family not only having to struggle with the shock of losing Mark, but they also had to live in fear. I just remember packing the kids up to my mum's for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to have them safe. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been terrifying. It was. It was an awful mm. experience. Jack recalls the meeting was meant to be a mediation between the brothers and the two suspects. What do you re remember of that meeting? Oh, we was all in one little room and it was getting a bit airy. What, what was their kind of attitude, do you remember? They was jumpy. Yeah. They was jumpy. They was, well, everything was pointing towards them, so they had to sort of like come forward and say, hey, we never done it, you know? So this was like six months after? Yeah. When I heard about the police not only allowing, but facilitating a meeting between Mark's family and the prime suspects, I thought it sounded highly unethical. So I approached one of Australia's most respected law enforcement experts, former New South Wales Assistant Police Commissioner Clive Small. 
the local Aboriginal liaison officer so with the support of the local police called a conference with some of those suspects. Obviously it didn't end very well. I mean, is that inappropriate? Well, I'd have serious concerns about that meeting because if you have a suspect, and we're talking about a suspect for a murder or for an alleged murder, um, I don't see how you have a mediation with the murderer and the family. So I think there's some serious questions about how that came about and what would be the legality of that issue if there was a prosecution and that was attempted to introduce those conversations into evidence. Clive is one of Australia's most successful detectives. One man has been arrested and charged with armed hold-up. Now retired, he is most recognised for his work in bringing down serial killer Ivan Milat, who murdered at least seven backpackers between 1989 and 1992. Clive headed the seven-month investigation into the murders, culminating in Milat's arrest in 1994. I put my other main concerns about the Oxley Local Area Command's handling of the case to Clive. It's clear that there are a lot of unresolved issues and there are a lot of answers required. The link to watch part two of this intriguing story can be found below.